100 Ways to Improve Your Investment Results with William J. O'Neill, founder and chairman of Investors Business Daily and the best-selling author of How to Make Money in Stocks. Mr. O'Neill has advised more than 500 of the world's largest institutional investors and developed the widely used Daily Graph Service. Do you realize that you have more potential to make money than most other people in the world? The reason is that you live in the most economically successful country on earth. On this tape, I'm going to tell you how you can substantially increase your income by investing in what I call the new America. Absolutely anyone can do it, regardless of your current position in life. Along the way, I'll show you more than 100 specific ways to improve your overall results. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the attitude you'll need as a successful investor. You have enormous opportunities today in our new America. Now, I know this is not what's being drilled into your head every night by our national TV networks. They love to tell you about all of the bad news, everything that's wrong or negative about our nation. They dwell on all of the problems and emphasize the lack of opportunities. It's downright discouraging and depressing to be told night after night about all the things that don't work, but that's what our national news media defines as news. Well, it may not be headline news to them, but the United States leads the world in high technology, in computer software, and in microcomputers. We lead the world in military capabilities, in medical instruments, wonder drugs, and scientific research. We have more than 25 times as many Nobel Prize winners as Japan. We're the world's top exporter, and we produce more goods and services than any country in the world, including Japan. Did you know that from 1982 to 1990, we created nearly 19 million jobs, more than all of Europe and Japan combined? And that's why you have the highest standard of living in the world. This is a country that's worth investing in. We lead the world in successful new entrepreneurial companies, companies that you can and definitely should learn about. This is the unheard of, rarely promoted new America. Why do I call it a new America? Because right now there are hundreds of these outstanding new companies that are growing rapidly and creating most of America's new products, services, and new jobs. This is the new America you should always look for because this is the new America that will make you money. There's also an impulse evolving. I call it the six-month entrepreneurial cycle. A fresh new crop of these innovative companies emerge on our national scene on a regular basis. That's why you can't afford to be out of the market for long, because you'll probably miss the next round of new market winners. Did you know that three quarters of the 100 best performing companies in the stock market since the 1987 crash were new companies? Companies formed in the 1970s and 80s that had their first public offering in the previous 5, 10, or 15 years? Listen, everyone knows General Motors, Sears, or IBM, but how many of you really knew about and understood Cisco Systems, Wellfleet Communications, Sybase, Cracker Barrel, or any of this year's innovative new leaders? Most of these new enterprises are headquartered in the South or the West. Some may be right in your own backyard. Have you ever shopped in a Home Depot, Walmart, or Circuit City? Well, did you invest in their stock? Did you capitalize on the opportunity available to you during these retailers' years of great performance? Of course, in time, some of these leaders may fall by the wayside, but the key point is they will be replaced by a crop of new leaders each year. This is entrepreneurial America, relentlessly growing by always renewing itself. Isn't it about time you learned how to take advantage of America's new growth companies? Now, you may be asking, if there are so many great new companies, why haven't most Americans invested in them? Why haven't most Americans made money from them? I'll tell you why. It's a complete lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, plus plain old fear. When you don't know about something or you're not sure, you'll always have doubts and you'll hesitate and never act. In just a few seconds, I'm going to show you a simple method you can use to overcome the fear that's kept you from taking full advantage of the opportunities in the market. Let me tell you how I developed these methods. Years ago, I decided to study all of the top performing companies since 1953. I built models of all those corporations at an early emerging stage just before their common stock doubled or tripled in price. We analyzed every big winner during seven or eight different market cycles. We also examined every fundamental and technical market variable showing in each company's stock at the time. Everything from a company's sales, earnings, products, profit margins, P-E ratio, to price and volume patterns, industry group action, relative price strength, the works. There were more than 500 outstanding examples, 
and we made some startling discoveries. Seven basic factors occurred over and over again in almost all of these greatest winning businesses. I assigned a letter for each of the seven key characteristics and created the easy to remember acronym CAN SLIM. The CAN SLIM method has helped thousands of successful investors materially improve their results. Here's how it works. The letter C stands for current earnings per share. Our study proved that three out of four of these best performing enterprises showed earnings increases averaging more than 70% in the latest reported quarter before the company's stock began its major price advance. Nearly all of the companies showed a significant pickup or acceleration in their percentage rate of quarterly earnings in some point in the prior eight or ten quarters. Now, as a general rule, you should consider restricting your purchases to companies showing quarterly earnings up at least 25% in the most recent quarter compared to the same quarter a year earlier. The higher the percentage improvement, the better. Remember, 70% was the average increase shown. That means many companies had increases of 100 to 200 percent. The second letter, A, stands for annual earnings per share. Take a look at the last five years' earnings. Each year's annual earnings should display an increase over the prior year. You might accept one year being down as long as the following year's earnings quickly recovered. The annual compounded growth rate of earnings in the firms you select for purchase should be from 25 to 50 percent or even more per year. That's because three out of four big winning companies showed this type of growth. Many traded in the NASDAQ market, and many of these new leaders emerged during a company's fifth to tenth year in business. I know a lot of people believe religiously in following a stock's price to earnings ratio, but P ratios were found not to be as important as the percentage change in a company's earnings per share. Earnings increases were also found to be substantially more important than dividends or book value. So put your main emphasis on a stock's percentage increase in annual and quarterly earnings per share, not dividends, book value, or P.E. ratio. N, the third letter in the word can, stands for new. Exceptional winning corporations almost always have a hot new product or service that is selling rapidly or they're experiencing a major change in conditions within their industry. Sometimes they also have new management. There's another important new that's characteristic of emerging market leaders. They're just about to make a new high in price. Less than 2% of all investors will buy a common stock when it's making a new high because they're afraid or ignorant. And yet, finding a new high in price is generally one of the better ways to locate truly successful companies. The new high list in Investor's Business Daily is an excellent way to prospect for new investment ideas. The new low list is a good place to avoid. If this sounds a little hard to accept, just ask yourself this question. If a stock's been going back and forth from 40 to 50 for several months, and it's going to ultimately go to 100, how do you think it gets there? It goes 51, 52, 53, 54, and every point is a new high. You definitely should refer to the 15 chart examples in the booklet, Your Guide to Investors Business Daily. You'll find illustrations of proper chart patterns and exactly when to buy a stock as it begins to make new highs. For even more examples, turn to chapter 13 and 14 of my book, How to Make Money in Stocks. They contain more than 100 pictures of perfect chart patterns and buy points. Back to Ken Slim. The letter S represents the number of shares outstanding in a corporation's capitalization. It is a simple matter of supply and demand. Other things being equal, the venture with a small or reasonable number of shares will usually outperform the corporation with a large number of shares outstanding. A company with less than 30 million shares of common stock outstanding can be moved up in price easier than one with 300 million shares. The L in Can Slim stands for leader or laggard. Are you buying one of the two or three best performing companies in an industry group? Or are you buying a laggard or low-priced, lower-quality stock in the group? Most laggards may appear safer and a better value to you, but they seldom perform like the real leaders in the group. Laggards try to advance in sympathy with the leaders, but they usually falter and fail after a small amount of progress. You want the very best companies you can find, not the ones at the cheapest price. Now, one simple way to spot most market laggards is to see if their stock's relative price strength is below 70. A stock's relative price strength is measured on a scale of 1 to 99, with 99 being highest. So a stock with a relative price strength less than 70 
is definitely weaker. And all too frequently, there's a real reason why it's slower and weaker performing. On the other hand, stocks ranking 80 or higher generally have a much better potential. The average relative strength of the greatest winning companies in the last 40 years, just before they emerged out of sound bases and before they doubled or tripled in price, was 87. Institutional sponsorship is also very important in picking a stock. It's the I in Can Slim. Here's why. It takes big demand to affect a company's supply of stock. And the largest source of demand for a stock by far is the institutional buyer, mutual funds, and pension funds. They dominate the market. The public doesn't. So make sure your stocks have at least some institutional sponsorship. You can find out if they do by checking with your broker or the research department of your local library. And remember, most institutions won't buy $4 and $5 stocks, so avoid poor quality, cheap stocks. They're usually low priced for a very good reason. M is the last but most important letter in Can Slim because it stands for the market. If you're wrong about the direction of the broad general market averages, you'll be wrong on three out of four of your investments. You must stay in phase with the market and be right in this crucial element. Arguing with the market is usually costly. My book, How to Make Money in Stocks, also has an entire chapter on how to interpret the general market, and Investor's Business Daily has one whole page devoted to all of the important general market indicators. Get a point to quickly check out the general market indicator page every day. Now that you know the seven basic characteristics of the most outstanding stocks in America, you may wonder, how can I build an investment portfolio and when should I sell my stock? A story I like to tell at our investment seminars shows exactly how you should manage your list of stocks. Let's pretend you own a women's clothing store. You buy a dozen dresses in three colors yellow, green, and red. The red dresses are quickly sold out, the green ones are only half sold, and you haven't sold even one yellow dress. Well, what do you do? Do you say, no one likes the yellow dresses, but yellow's my favorite color, so let's buy some more of them anyway? Certainly not. If you're smart, you say, we sure made a mistake. We'd better get rid of those yellow dresses. Mark them down 10%, let's have a sale. If they don't sell at that price, mark them down again. Get our money out of those old dogs that no one wants and put in more of the hot red dresses that are in big demand. This is just common sense in a retail business. But do you do this with your investments? Why not? Everyone makes buying errors. The buyers for department stores are professional buyers and even they make lots of mistakes. When you do slip up, as soon as you recognize it, sell and go on to the next thing. You don't have to be right on all of your investment decisions to make a worthwhile net profit. But why do you miss the big winners? In my more than 30 years of experience analyzing the American economy and its securities market, there are three main reasons. First of all, the name of the company and its business are relatively unknown to you because it's a newer company incorporated in the last 10 years or so. It's part of the new America. Second, Investors are afraid to buy stocks at new price highs, and the best stocks always look too high to them. They want to buy stocks that look cheap, that they think are real bargains, so they buy laggard companies. And third, the price-earnings ratio always looks too high. Well, let me set the record straight. Our model studies of the greatest winning stocks from 1953 to the present show that their P.E. ratios average 20 at the beginning of their dramatic price increases. The typical big winner expanded his P.E. ratio to 45 throughout the stock's advance, which lasted on average 18 months. Now, stop and think about this for a minute. Between 1953 and today, if you refuse to pay between 20 and 30 times earnings for a stock, you automatically eliminated all of the most outstanding stocks in America. I know it's not easy to kick old habits and faulty beliefs, so if you still believe in only buying low P.E. stocks, let's suppose for a moment you're the manager of your favorite big league baseball team. You're in the off-season, and you want to improve your team by trading for some new players and calling some up from the minor leagues. You've got your choice. Are you going to trade for as many 100 and 200 hitters or as many 300 hitters as possible? Now, everybody knows those 300 hitters are overpriced. Their P.E. ratios are too high. After all, no ball player is worth several million dollars a year. That's totally ridiculous. So what would happen if we recruit a whole lineup of 100 and 200 hitters? They're a better value, aren't they? 
Come on, how many ball games are you going to win with a lineup of 100 and 200 hitters? Who do you want to send to the plate when the score is tied in the ninth inning and the bases are loaded? Your 100 hitter or a 300 hitter? You see, the cold reality is that whether you're talking ball players or stocks, everything tends to sell for just about what it's worth at the time. The 300 hitters are worth a lot more because they're proven producers. The 100 hitters sell for lower prices because of their poor past record. So if you want to make money investing, get rid of your yellow dresses and stop buying 100 and 200 hitters. Now a lot of people think you have to be right all of the time to do well in the market. That's not true and it's simply not being realistic. You're going to make many mistakes, the smartest professionals do. The secret to making money is to lose the least amount of money possible when you're wrong. I like to limit all of my losses to 7 or 8 percent. For example, if I buy a stock at 50 and it drops 7 percent below my cost to a price of 46 and a half, I'll sell it to cut short my loss. This is an advantage you have over all institutional or mutual fund managers. You can cut a loss quickly. A fund manager, on the other hand, has more shares, can't move as fast, and will impact the market substantially more. If you're a new investor, you might start by cutting your losses at 10 percent. But as you gain in skill, you'll probably tighten your parameters. This loss-cutting rule applies to a stock that is 7 or 8 percent below the price you paid. It does not pertain to a stock bought at 50, say, that rises to 65 and then declines 7 or 8 percent from that point. At 65, you have a nice profit cushion and you can afford to give your stock more leeway for normal fluctuations and price consolidations. I'll bet you have tried cutting your losses at some point in the past. Let's say you sold a stock when it was down 10 percent. What usually happened to you when you sold your stock to cut a loss? In most cases, the stock went right back up in price, right? What did you say to yourself when that happened? That was a stupid thing to do. I never should have sold it. I'll never do that again. But let me ask you a question. Were you really wrong just because you sold a stock to cut a loss and the stock went back up afterwards? Well, think a minute. Did you buy fire insurance on your home or your business last year? Did your house burn down? If it didn't, are you upset because you wasted your money on the insurance? Are you going to buy fire insurance on your home or business next year? Sure you are. Why did you buy fire insurance in the first place? Because you knew your house was going to burn down? No. You bought insurance to protect yourself against the remote chance that you might suffer a severe loss. That's exactly what you're doing when you cut short all of your losses. You're taking out little insurance policies to protect yourself against the possibility that you could suffer a devastating loss. Let's think about it another way. If you let any stock go down 50 percent, how much do you have to make on the next stock you buy just to get back even? You have to make 100 percent, and how often do you buy stocks that double? Not often, so you can't afford to let any stock drop 50 percent, can you? Every 50 percent loss began as a 10 percent loss, so catch your mistakes early. Some people go to great lengths to rationalize away their mistakes. It's a good stock. I'm still getting my dividends. Well, what's a 3 percent dividend if the stock's down 25 percent from your cost? It's a big, fat 22 percent loss, isn't it? There are two other common sense reasons why you should always cut short your losses. If you sit through long, worrying declines in your stocks where your loss gets larger and larger, it could affect your health. No stock is worth worrying about in ruining your health. So if you're staying up at night agonizing over your stocks, sell down to the sleeping point. Remember, all stocks are speculative and involve substantial risk. I once sold national video at $99 a share and ultimately watched the stock decline to $1. My philosophy is all stocks are bad. There are no good stocks, no investment grade stocks that can't decline sharply. They're all bad, unless they go up in price. And don't let anyone tell you that you should buy more and average down once you have a loss. That's throwing good money after bad. You should average up, not down. If I haven't convinced you yet, let me give you another reason you need to cut losses early. If you sit through a long bear market with your stocks continuing to decline, you're certain to lose your confidence at just the wrong moment. It's very important for you to always maintain your balance so you'll have the courage and confidence to buy aggressively right when a new bull market begins. You may want to set up rules for yourself to maintain your perspective, flexibility, and discipline. 
Now, the reason I'm emphasizing the loss-cutting side so much is because rule number one in my book is always protect your account against severe losses. In professional football, baseball, and basketball, championships are usually won by the team that has the best defense. The typical investor in individual stocks needs to develop a realistic and sound defensive plan too. Defense is also an important strategy in selling. Let me tell you why. If you cut all your losses at 7 or 8 percent and you take 25 percent profits in at least half of your individual stocks when they show that type of gain, you can be wrong three times and right only once and still not get into trouble. And if you can't be right at least one out of four times, you know you've got another problem, right? Either the general market is terrible or your stock selection criteria is awful. So here's what I'm saying. Sell half of your stocks that show a 25% gain because in the market, a bird in hand really is worth two in the bush. Have you ever had a stock go up 25% or more and then come all the way back down and you lost the whole profit? That's why I say nail down a few as you go along. You'll still have the money from the proceeds to find another potential winner and three consecutive 25% gainers in a year compounds out to nearly a 100% profit for the year. If you sell half of your stocks that show a 25% gain, then you can hold the other half in order to try and develop a larger long-term profit. Now, how do you decide which 25% gainers to hold? This is tricky and it takes time to learn. Try to hold the stock you know the most about, the one that you have the most confidence in, and the one that actually has performed best so far. What is the company's earnings estimate for this year and next year? If the company's estimates turn out to be true and you use the current P-E ratio as a guide, what potential does the stock have? It's always your patient sitting, not your brilliant thinking that makes the best gains. Over the years, my four best gains were in Syntex in the early 1960s, Pick and Save in the late 1970s, Price Company when they opened their third store in California, and Amgen in 1990-91. These stocks had increases varying from 4 to 20 times. The pick and save was held through thick and thin for seven and a half years, and Price Company was held for three and a half years. Sometimes you have to be patient and willing to sit through several normal corrections. And of course, it's easier to sit if you really know a company and its realistic earnings potential. This is also a little easier to do when you're dealing with consumer companies because you can physically check them out. I used to always count the cars in the parking lots and see how many people were actually buying items inside a retail store. There are a number of other selling rules that you should know about. When a company's quarterly earnings reports slow their percentage rate of growth by two-thirds for two quarters in a row, the stock is either likely to decline or at least consolidate for a substantial period of time. A two-thirds slowdown occurs when, for example, a stock's quarterly earnings reports have been increasing for many quarters by 100%, and then for the next two quarters, increase less than 33%. Another indication that it's time to sell is what we call a climax top. This occurs when a stock advances strongly for many months and then suddenly runs up in price faster than normal for 8 to 10 consecutive days or more. At the same time, the stock's price spread from high to low each week as shown on a weekly chart, becomes wider than before. If this wider spread continues for the two to three weeks, you should generally sell. You may also want to consider selling if a stock's relative price strength drops below 70. Another tip. You take a ruler and draw channel lines along several important tops and along several important bottoms throughout the stock's major price trend over many months. If your stock's price goes through the upside channel line, this can be another time to consider lightening up on your holdings. If several real leaders in an industry group top, this weakness will likely wash over into the rest of the group. That's another signal to sell. And of course, if everyone's running around all excited about how great a stock is, and they've just put the CEO's picture on the cover of Fortune or Business Week, it's probably time to get out, because it's getting too obvious, and the obvious seldom works in the stock market. Using daily or weekly charts can help a great deal in determining when to buy or sell a company stock. If you use charts, I would definitely recommend that once a year you take all of your buy and sell confirmation slips from your stockbroker and post on individual stock charts exactly where you bought and sold each of your stocks. Separate all your correct and profitable decisions from your mistakes and losses. If you do this, you'll make some amazing discoveries that will quickly tell you what you've been doing wrong. 
Maybe you're always buying stocks that are extended in price more than 10% from a sound base. Or maybe you're selling too soon or being shaken out too much. Or maybe you're just vacillating and always selling too late. Whatever it is, this objective analysis will help improve your results and can be worth thousands of dollars to you. So don't let yourself get discouraged by temporary reversals. Just learn to improve on your weaknesses until they become your strong points. If you'd like more selling tips, How to Make Money in Stocks has two complete chapters on this subject. I'd strongly suggest you read them. There is one last subject you may want to know about. How many stocks should you own? You've always heard all your life that you should invest intelligently by diversifying your portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I say this is questionable. To me, diversification is just a hedge against ignorance. I don't believe any individual should widely diversify. Why should anyone own 20 stocks or more? How can you know all that you should know about all of these companies? If the market turns bad and you sell one or two stocks, you're still almost fully invested and you haven't protected yourself. On the other hand, if you only own four or five stocks, You can watch them like a hawk, and if you sell a couple, you're already 40 or 50% in cash. If, for example, you have $5,000 to invest, two stocks might be a way to begin. If you have $20,000, perhaps four stocks, and $100,000, maybe four, five, or six. You can also diversify in time by making follow-up buys on existing positions once you show a profit. If you average up, buy a little less dollar-wise than on your earlier buys so that you don't get your average cost too high. And don't chase a stock when it's up more than 5 to 10% from a sound and correct base. You may be wondering, how well does this CanSlim method work? Are there other people besides Bill O'Neill who have used it successfully? The answer is yes. I've probably given seminars to 100,000 people over the years, and every time there are quite a few who come up and say they've really improved their investment results because they attended one of our sessions a year or two earlier. David Ryan won the U.S. Investing Championships three years in a row using the CanSlim system. He averaged over 100% a year investing real money in his own account. Just a few years later, Lee Freestone, another one of our associates, entered the same contest and used the CanSlim method to post gains of 278% and 120%. Peter Strachan credited How to Make Money in Stocks and CanSlim for winning a Canadian stock market challenge that paid him a $1 million annuity. So if you're willing to work at it, read How to Make Money in Stocks, and listen to a few of our tapes, who knows what you could do. Remember, the new America is still open for business, and every six months, new entrepreneurial leaders will emerge. The only question is, will you see them and know how to take full advantage of them? One last subject we should cover is that of mutual funds. How can you make big money investing in mutual funds? First, make sure you pick the right kind of fund. You need to select a diversified domestic growth stock fund whose performance ranks in the top 15% of all funds over the last three or four years. Then you buy it and sit tight. Don't think. Plan to sit with it as long as you live. Once you own a fund, it's your sitting that makes the really big money, not your thinking or overanalyzing. You handle a growth fund exactly the opposite of how you handle individual stocks. You have to cut losses in individual stocks because your investment is more concentrated and a stock could go to zero. But in a fund, you've retained professional management that will broadly diversify your holdings, and the fund's widely diversified portfolio will in time recover from the periodic bear markets. You should plan at an absolute minimum to sit through the next four or five bear markets, and if your fund is down 25% from its peak price, which will almost certainly occur many times, Plan to buy more and keep sitting. Those additional purchases could be worth 100% more two to three years later. The key to making big money in equity mutual funds is to let the principle of compounding work for you over as many five-year periods as possible. This requires real courage, strong stomach, and faith as strong as steel, plus a long-term plan that you will not violate. Here's how the secret power of compounding works. If you invest $10,000, and assume an average rate of growth of 15% per year, with some years being up more and some years actually showing losses, at the end of the first five-year period, your fund could be worth $20,000. Now, here's the real secret. In the next five years, your $20,000 doesn't grow to $30,000. It grows to $40,000. 
and the next five years, the 40,000 doesn't go to 50,000, it goes to 80,000. And the following five years, the 80,000 doesn't grow to 90, it grows to 160,000. Wow, you invested $10,000 and now it's worth 160,000. And that's the way it's done. Of course, if you started with $100,000, you could have $1.6 million. And if you bought more every time your fund was off 25% from its peak, you'll have more than $2 million. So that's why I say the whole secret is to promise yourself that you will definitely sit through thick and thin and stick with your fund for as long as you live. That's the way the real money is made. This is the end of side one. For a guide to understanding investors' business daily, please turn this cassette to side two.